Okay, I'm not gonna lie, Greed is definitely my favorite. I am totally biased. Both of his voice actors did a fantastic job, like, you know, all of the voice actors in the series. His arc was by far the most interesting of all of the homunculi, and I loved his relationship with Ling, his... roommate? But before I get around to actually talking about Greed, remember what I said in my Lust review about personification as a literary device? When you're using personification as the basis of a character, you need a clear definition of the concept you're personifying. Otherwise, the personification will end up completely unrecognizable or generic. The clearer a definition a concept has, however, the more difficult it is to write a character that embodies that. Real people don't embody concepts. Even the most loving person in your life isn't love incarnate unless he's Jesus. Long story short, it's really hard to relate to a protagonist who is only one thing, and so the more we make this idea into a character, the more we need to necessarily deviate from that idea to make a reasonably compelling character. Of all the homunculi, I have always felt like Greed was the most human. Granted, a lot of the homunculi were really well-developed characters, Wrath and Envy come to mind, but he was more protagonist than antagonist through most of his arc. So I just felt like he was more of a greedy person than a person defined by his greed. He had a lot of quirks which didn't relate at all to his avarice, such as his swearing or his rudeness or his vague moral principles. Even his vice, if you're willing to give it a little bit of a broad definition, is more often shown in humans than other homunculi in the series. See, I'm greed. I want everything you can think of. Money and women, power and sex, status, glory. I demand the finer things. And of course, I crave eternal life. I desire the finer things in life is kind of Greed's motto. He wants things, hypothetically, but he's not exactly a hoarder because he doesn't have a house to put stuff in. Instead, he tries to get stuff through getting power, I guess? Because of his whole world domination plan, I think it's safe to say that Greed, more so than the other homunculi, does chase power. So it's kind of sad that his special power is so... bland. I mean, it's useful. He can turn his skin into a carbon-based ultimate shield, which can ward off any non-alchemical attack. He can turn that carbon shield into graphite, but doesn't do that for obvious reasons. His shield is great for defense, but it's honestly not the coolest homunculus quirk. So why did Arakawa give him the ultimate shield? Well, I can't say I'm 100% sure. My best guess is that it has something to do with avarice as a defense mechanism, covering up for your own inadequacies by consuming things. This would also explain why he can't hold the shield and heal at the same time. You can't overcome your problems when you're pretending that they don't exist. But Greed doesn't need a flashy special ability because he's flashy enough already. He uses his charisma to influence people, and for all of his I work alone, he doesn't. He, he really likes having a posse around him to praise him and help him along. Also, when we first meet him, he has a bunch of chimera groupies who seem to stick around out of real loyalty and not bribes or threats or anything. Now, it's anybody's guess about how he gained that loyalty, but it seems to me pretty likely that he ended up taking them away from the military. Because, you know, there would be a way for him to stick it to father, and he loves that. Greed also wants to join Ed when Ed offers him a place in his posse, and cheerfully accepts once the technical on the books of ownership of the group is switched over to him. And this is literally never brought up again, so Ed doesn't change his behavior at all, he just says, I'm following you, and then gives instructions. It's hilarious. Furthermore, in the extended final boss battle, he bosses around everyone, even complete strangers, for their own good. It's hilarious. Greed's also the only homunculus to openly claim a moral code. Now, this is not exactly the most developed moral code, it's basically don't lie and don't hurt women and children if you can avoid it, but hey, it's better than nothing. I mean, if you need a worldwide dictator, I'd rather have this guy than this guy. This is not to say he's the nicest person in the world. I mean, Greed 1.0 lets his buddies be his meat shields when fighting Wrath. And Greed 2.0 is constantly on the verge of betraying the good guys so he can steal Father's power. On that topic, Greed is also the only homunculus to betray Father. And this was clearly not some cool, calculated decision just so he could take Father's place. There is some serious bad blood between the two. I mean, he totally wants the power too, but he wouldn't be this furious if it wasn't personal. Now, we don't know precisely what pushed Greed over the edge. 
One fan theory says that before Wrath became a separate entity, Father was abusively short-fused. Greed wouldn't let Father beat him up, and so he finally decided to just up and leave. This would explain Greed's unusual decency towards his possessions. But Father also took Greed into himself after Greed 1.0 was smelted, and he didn't act any different. Granted, we only saw him in like two scenes in the interim, but we didn't see any abnormal signs of his greediness, so we don't know how having a vice inside of him affects Father. Another possibility is that Father promised Greed something, maybe domination of the world, maybe godlike power, and Greed learned that Father never intended to actually give it to him. This would account for Greed's no lies policy, but as I said before, it's anybody's guess. The important part is that he left and would rather be boiled into a philosopher's stone than return. Now because of this, the other homunculi I don't really associate with Greed very much. But we gather that he looks down on Sloth, and Gluttony, and Envy. Envy in particular hates him back, but that's because Envy's oversensitive and Greed can't get through five minutes without mocking somebody. The first thing Lust does in the episode where Greed 1.0 dies is tell him to stop sleeping in when he was knocked out and strung up on a stick, so he flirts with her and then collectively mocks everybody in the room for never changing. Now for a person who collects people the same way toddlers collect stuffed animals, it's a little bit weird that he never tries to get them on his side, but Greed is pretty good about putting his mind before his avarice and he knows that they won't switch sides. Frankly, if they did, he might hate having them around just because he doesn't like sharing. After Edling and Envy are briefly eaten by Gluttony, a large number of the main cast meets Father for the first time. Now, in this really overblown encounter, Ling is taken captive and Father figures, eh, here's body, might as well hack up my most annoying son into it. Ling, being a little bit too devoted to his immortality project, agreed and was instantly possessed by a brain-wiped homunculus. This Greed 2.0 is unique among the homunculi in that he is the only human-based homunculus who has to room with his body's original soul. Now, may I take a moment here to just mention, the animators did a wonderful job with cueing us in on who's who. I mean, even voices aside, it is easier to tell who is in control of the body at the moment than it is for me to tell which of my twin cousins is which. Now, Ling is one stubborn son of a Xingyi Emperor, and so literally the moment the Greed takes over, he starts ordering him around. Like, literally the same day, he manages to convince Greed to send a message to Lan Fawn for him. Now, this new Greed goes about presumably on guard duty for a little while before his old friend Beto appears. Now, Greed finds him trespassing, Beto rolls a nat 20 in perception and realizes that this is somehow his old friend, and not remembering him, Greed stabs him with his... hand. That shakes up Greed's memories a little bit, and suddenly Greed realizes that he just killed his last remaining friend. Now, Greed Ling's relationship is entirely based on Greed insulting Ling and Ling telling Greed to face up to harsh truths, and it is genuinely one of my favorite things about Brotherhood. So Ling takes this opportunity to tell Greed that obviously these people weren't just possessions to him, they were friends, part of his soul. This wording is interesting, since Greed technically doesn't have a soul. But he's obviously the same person from Doublet, so he's more than just a part of Father that can be taken and recycled. Greed, not being the best at claiming responsibility for his actions, blames Wrath for his friend's deaths, which Wrath is mostly to blame for, but come on Greed, you were ready to leave them behind, and goes on a very ineffective revenge trip. Thematically, this is a very interesting conflict, because if you view Wrath the Vice as inherently destructive, then it makes perfect sense that Avarice would be opposed to it. You can't both rule the world and watch it burn. Greed has a similar problem with pride. Pride doesn't care about anyone or anything but himself and his mission. Greed is protective of pretty much anyone who isn't opposed to him for two consecutive episodes. So pride thinks Greed's weak and Greed thinks pride's a monster. Which he totally is. Still, Greed's not exactly a good guy at this point. I mean, his end goal is world domination. At least, he says so? But Greed's not as simple as he thinks he is. You want to bring back someone that you've lost. You might want money. Maybe you want women. Or you might want to protect the world. These are all common things people want. Things that their hearts desire. Greed may not be good, but it's not so bad either. You humans think greed is just for money and power, but everyone wants something they don't have. Arakawa's greed wants to be selfish. That's how he defines himself. But he cares so much about other people that his priorities aren't even clear to himself anymore. In his book, The We Free Men, Terry Pratchett wrote, All witches are selfish, the queen had said. Then turn selfishness into a weapon. Make all things yours. My dreams, my brother, my family, my land, my world. 
How dare you try to take these things, because they are mine! Greed is so selfish that he begins to start acting selflessly because he cares more about other people than his own well-being. To very near the end, he denies this. In his final fight against Father, Greed tries to take the power of God into himself so he can take over the whole world. Father, being Father, tries to kill him, but Ed steps in. And then Greed watches as an entire courtyard of people cheer Ed on. Greed. This is what you desperately wanted. Yeah, you're right. This is what I wanted. I wanted the chance to have friends like these. There's a startling comparison here between father and greed, because both are, in their own ways, very avaricious. Both want power over the laws of nature and people. Father, when he reaches his lowest point, tries to kill his son to save himself. Ling tells Greed to fight back, that together they can beat him. But then, for the first and only time, Greed lies to make Ling let go. He sacrifices himself to save Ling and the others. In other words, Greed dies selflessly. And you know my favorite part? His redemption arc had consequences for other people around him. I mean, most specifically, Ling. You can clearly see when Ling tells Mei that all of the clans are going to be under his protection when he's emperor, that the greed has rubbed off on him. I mean, seriously, you can see it in his body language. He's acting just like greed in this scene, and Ling may have been greed's conscience for six months, but greed taught Ling how to care for his enemies. And I just, I love it. I almost forgot to talk about Dante's Purgatorio in this video, and for good reason, because, you know, the punishment of the greedy in Dante's Purgatorio doesn't really connect very much here. They sit on the ground and weep. That's about it. So I guess you could try to connect that with Greed's unfortunate death, but, I mean, it's a bit of a stretch. However, in the Inferno, the Greedy are boiled in oil, so, you know, that reminds me of something. Oh my goodness, this is finally over, now I have my summer back. Wait. <laughs> anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this series at least half as much as I enjoyed making it. I may not be able to post as regularly in the next few months because college, but if you have any ideas for what I should do next, please leave them in the comment section down below, and keep an eye out for me.